Manifestation, is it real? Or is it all a figment of our imagination? And then, perhaps, that's exactly what life is. A figment of our imagination. Or is it? This is Karina, Break Fear, Find Freedom. And I'm welcoming you to our conversation with Tom Kelly today, all about manifestation, life, love, and the possibilities, the endless possibilities of all of this. So, if you're new here, welcome. If you're coming back to listen, thank you for being here and grab your coffee and enjoy this conversation. And I'd love to hear your comments and what do you think about all this manifestation excitement around all of this. See you inside. Well. Yes, um, every time, every time I have that attitude, it, it manifests. Like with this uh, vacation to, um, I, I was talking with friends, and they were saying, "Oh, they're going here and they're going there." And I was thinking, "Oh, you know what? A vacation would be nice. It's my eight year an eight year anniversary this month, and um, like that would be great." But uh, you know what? Doesn't happen. A few days, and then I forgot about it. A few days later, I got this invitation, like, oh, we're going to Mammoth. Do you want to come with? And it's like, wow. And then there's other things where it's like, you know what? I really want this. I really want this. I really want And the more you hold on to it, the less it comes. <laughs> if you, and, and, uh, and, as I, and I'm feeling now, as I'm feeling like, oh, I don't want this anymore. It doesn't matter. Whether I do or whether I don't, it's okay. Um, you, you can actually feel the shift of the energy and you know that at some point it will come uh, when you least expect it. So maybe that is the secret. That's, the secret is take the time factor out of it and say, it's going to happen, I don't care when. Yes, That's yes. That's probably the whole thing. It's, it just, it's definitely going to happen because I've put out the idea it's going to happen sometime. And when, when is going to be the perfect time? And if it doesn't happen tomorrow, that's really saved me from something else. Yes, like, yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Wow, that is so profound. Thank you. Yes. But I've, I've like, silly things, like how... I'll think, oh, you know what, I, uh, I need a pair of shoes, not like shoes, because I'm talking about shoes. Mm -hmm. And I'll go and someone will say, oh, you know what, I bought these shoes and they don't fit me, do you want them? You know, like something random like that. And it's, it's like that, just that instant feeling and then just forget about it again. It's like, it doesn't matter whether I get it or I don't, I really don't care. Really. And when some of those littlest things happen, you say, oh my. That is so totally not a coincidence. Yes. And then you're like, but nothing is. There's no random. And then you say, okay, the next time I get down in the dark, deep despair, I'm going to remember that silly little instant and remember that everything is always exactly as it should be. And, and you don't. But they're so, eventually they pile up so much that you think, oh my God. <coughs> it's, it's always exactly what it's meant. It really yes. is. Yes. And yes. Then, then you relax and then it all happens to it. <laughs> yes. Yes. And that's when you realize wow, you know what, I'm really not alone here. <laughs> you know, this quantum thing actually is real. Um, and of course, that's also like off the wall and, and you can't really explain it. But if you really think about it, it, it has to be. Like, how do, you, how do things just happen? No coincidence. What do you mean by this quantum thing is real? You know, this quantum, the quantum, um, quantum physics is real. If you think about it, I mean, it's real because you, 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 you think about things and then a few days later, someone comes and says, hey, we're going on holiday. Why don't you want to come with? Or, hey, uh, I've got these shoes that I bought yesterday and they don't fit me. Do you want them? How is that possible? There has to be a connection between all of us, right? Where we, what we think has to go out into the universe and someone has to pick that up. How else would you explain it? Unless we all won, right? And that means we all won at, at some point. Of course we are. That's, that's a different way of looking at the, the, to me, I think you're absolutely right. I, I don't pretend to be a quantum physicist. I've no grasp whatsoever the math, but, but I think that the people who do grasp the math often, like Einstein and stuff, don't grasp that, oh my God, they say the laws of physics and Newtonian physics break down at quantum level. And I think, are you sure? Because if the macro world functions of the same way, then it means that 
through the prism or the lens of our consciousness that the what they call it, the cloud of probability, the the what they call it, the superposition, whatever condenses that that the the infinite possibilities are condensed to one at a time through our lens. That there is all this, all these possible dreams and realities, and that when we focus a concentrate or expect to manifest one, lo and behold, that's the one we're living in. Yes. To me, that's the yes. essence of it, and that yes. the macro world does function. Yes. And it's so big and so overwhelming that idea that most of the brilliant quantum physics in history have thought with that idea. Most notably and famously, Einstein, when he said, speak the action at distance. How could it possibly be that if one entangled photon or electron of one, Furthest reach of the universe is measured that simultaneously the other one assumes the, the, the complementary position. That couldn't happen, Einstein said. And yet, and yet, and yet, and yet Einstein said famously, imagination is more important, I think, than knowledge. The knowledge is limited in the imagination in circles of the world. And when he said that, I don't think he meant literally that our awareness in circles the big bang. But that's how I see it. And, and interestingly enough, during the week for our comedy, I was researching Bill Hicks. Bill Hicks has such amazing insights. And one of them was the famous one about the positive drug story. He says, today, imagine, instead of talking about guys jumping out of buildings on acid, uh, and I, I don't, by the way, ever take recreational drugs of any kind, or even alcohol, and just not for me, thank you. But. Um, Instead of the news story today, a young man NASA jumped out of a building and, and died. Idiot. He said, why don't we get an occasional positive good drug story such as the famous quote, today young man on acid realized that all matter is just energy, the energy condensed to a slow vibration, that we are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There is no death, life is only a dream, and we are the imagination of ourselves. So that yeah. we are the imagination of ourselves, we are the consciousness of ourselves, subjectively, we are the awareness of ourselves. If 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 Einstein could agree that the imagination is consciousness, then the Big Bang may really, as I've said to you before, may be expanding into that same thing. And and if we are that consciousness, then at the macro level, at the human level, God knows how many levels there are, just like at the quantum level, so-called. One, we're entangled particles, and anything I do influences people I'm focused on, especially, or praying for, or thinking about, or loving, or caring about. Yes, and yes, two, yes. two if, I, if I let my vibration level, as the new age people would call it, and I guess I might be one of them, if I let my vibration drop and lose hope and become despairing and negative and down, probably when I need a rest, then, if I allowed myself to do that, it's like I dropped to a lower orbital of electron level. Mm -hmm. And if I if I summon from somewhere more psychic energy, more hope, more inspiration, then like a photon, I can leap to a higher level of influence. You know? And that Jesus, the great quantum physicist, of course, foretold that when he said, in my father's house are many mansions. If you were not, I would have told you so. But there are infinitude of parallel worlds for you to co-create or imagine or step into. Who knows? Yes. That's yes. a big speech. That's my understanding of how quantum physics operates just the same on macro as on micro level. So there's no such thing as the laws of physics breaking down. It's just that they're so we're so immersed in them that we can't see them. Yes. And the news is so good that we can't accept it, of course. That's also that. It's also that. And and then again, if we go back to the manifestation, you know, for the want of a better word, the the more we the, the more we focus on something that we want, right? The more we don't see what's around us and we don't see the actual resources and doors that are opening and it's like, hey, these are opening, but you're so focused on getting that thing that you think you want that you're missing out on all the other things. Um, and who knows what yes. that really is. Yes. You know? And sometimes afterwards you see, oh my goodness, the thing I wanted was like the breadcrumb chocolate that I was following head down. And yes. all these little, all these little wonderful incidents that happened along my way, they were meant to happen. And, and thank goodness I kind of half enjoyed them. And as time goes on, you enjoy them more and more because you realize <laughs> that, that that little um, whatever target bait that you're chasing after is really just to bring you along the journey. And, yes. and then you begin to pay more and more and more attention. You say, okay, I'm meant to be aiming for that thing, but by come, I'm meant to be encountering every little bit along the journey as I go. And you pay more and more attention to this stuff you need to on the way, don't you? 
Yes, yes. And that's probably one of the lessons about the, the, the headphones that we were talking about, the headset. Mm -hmm. uh, because when I walk, I, I wear my headset, I listen to stuff, and I'm not, very, I'm not very observant of my environment. I mean, I look at the trees and whatever and say, wow, thank you, it's so beautiful. But I'm not really observant. So that's probably why I lost it, you know, um, because it's like stop that and look around you because you are missing things all the time. And there are probably resources and doors that are opening as you're walking along the road anyway. But you're so focused yes. on, 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 on things that, I mean, big deal. You're listening to a podcast or whatever. You can listen to that anywhere, anytime. Or even why? Why are you doing that anyway? Hmm. Well, I approach total strangers, perfect strangers in the street all the time on my bike. And um, every now and again, someone is totally weird and says, I'm good, you know, to make it real. <laughs> but, but mostly, thankfully, if I can hold my nerve and I'm not too weird and creepy, they realize that I'm not too weird and creepy and they start talking to me, you know? But um, I'm amazed sometimes when I approach them with the headphones on, they look at me and they take off the phone and they're like, wow, how courteous that is, you know. But, but in the old days when I saw the headphones on, I wouldn't have dropped them out of the podcast, obviously. So I don't know what it's like, a woman of your age, guy my age, how it's like where you live. Walking, it's harder to stop and talk to people on a bike too, because if you're walking the same direction, if they want to get rid of you, they have to turn off somewhere. And yes. if you're passing by, they're stopped. Whereas on the bike, I can just I, I just walk along with them for a while and then goodbye. So the bike really facilitates the interactions. But but if I see them intent on their podcast and the headphone, I, I won't interact. So that's a warning to the world. If you don't interact, <laughs> the yes, on. and that's but it's also um, fear based, and it's like you know I'd rather stay alone here than to interact because I don't know what will happen if I interact with other people. Oh. Oh, really? If you think about it. You, but, you, you do, as a woman, you do feel that in something before? No, no. I just, it just came to me now. Because me, like now, it's, if, if I walk past people, you generally smile at them or say good morning. Because everybody's very friendly. I mean, I'm sure you've noticed that. Yes, yes. Um, no matter what. And then... And, and, and with the dogs as well, they walk, everyone's walking with some kind of dog or something, yeah. and they all come and they say hello to you, and you yeah. pet them, and the owners are so grateful. Mm -hmm. So you miss out on those opportunities if, you're, if you constantly have headphones, because people avoid you, and you avoid other people as well, because right. you, you're focused on yourself and on whatever you're listening to. Very good point. Right, 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 yeah. Yeah, so how many opportunities are you missing out on, even just to you know, smile at someone or interact with someone, you don't know what a difference you can make in their life because well, of it. You, when you realize what a difference it's made to you sometimes, when someone comes and gives you a really bright and says, oh my God, you just, what, what the, one glance from people. Yes, yes, yes. It's incredible what people can do people. Just yes. It's amazing, and you think about, I mean, there's, I always remember that story where um, someone was walking down the road and they smiled at someone and greeted them, and um, I don't know if this is a, an urban myth, okay? They smiled and greeted them, and, that, and then afterwards you hear that that person was going to go and jump off the building, but after that smile, it stopped them and they rethought and they went home instead. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that's like very dramatic. <laughs> It happens all okay. the time. I, I, but, I believe that happens all the time. I really do. Yes. So. And, and, um, and, and even when it's not as apparently, even if it doesn't stop and jump out of it can transform a life anyway. And it can make that person think, if they can do that, maybe I can learn to do that. Yes. But then yes. The worlds, I mean. Yes. Yes. I mean, so many people go through life, um, especially, you know, I was talking this morning um, with some while I was having coffee about homelessness. You know, there's so many homeless people um, coming in. There's just so many homeless people and they're the invisible people. If you can just like, instead of looking away when you see a homeless person, smile at them and realize that they just want to be seen like you. And you've also make it, you know, like maybe that day they realize, you know, this isn't the life I want to live and I, I, I have got up, whatever, you know, whatever it is, you don't know. But you can just make that one little difference to someone um, and to yourself as well. There's a, a lady, she contributes under the name No One to MIA Madden America blog commentaries a lot. 
And just last night, the day before yesterday, I was reading where she said that she had been homeless in Cambridge in England, same as at the Polo, funny enough, <laughs> and, though she's an American. And she said, um, she said from the heart, very strange, serious, long essay she wrote, but she said that if a single person had come up to her and listened to her story, absolutely everything would have changed. And the extraordinary thing was that she said that, knowing that she can do that for people now, and, and still from the rest of her essay, it was apparent that she she wasn't about doing that forever, and she didn't feel that she could. Well, what's stopping you? But but it's the same with all of us, that that we have these invisible barriers we make for ourselves. We, we, we just do, and yes. we can't even see them sometimes. And, and, and occasionally we fall through a barrier and we think, oh my goodness, you know, they're, they're there for breaking through. Well, Tola said something very interesting, I just got recently, you know, I'm a huge fan of Hickok Tola and his writings on YouTube, but um, one clip recently he said that, that there's this lag often when you summon, if you decide to train for something, you're not immediately fit as a while, you're strengthening the muscle. Yes, but, yes. But it's more immediate. If you go to climb a mountain often, you start off, and then you get this thing called second wind. <laughs> I think your metabolism shifts and suddenly your breathing becomes much easier. Even very yes, much. yes. But, and, and, and to me, that second wind, when I'm out in the heat working, um, I don't sweat easily. And if I have a hot drink, suddenly then I can begin to sweat when, I've had the, when I get a bit hotter. And suddenly all the barriers go, it's just a huge switch. But in a, the way we're made as humans, it seems a very basic part of us is that there's this little lag that <coughs> that when we decide to do anything, but usually the energy doesn't come immediately. Mm, mm, mm. And unless we're fully committed, we kind of get disheartened and we say, well, that's not going to happen. Yes. But yes. When, when we hold our nerve from it and we say, we wait, boy, it does come. And if we, if we have to just wait, we'll test it, we we'll wait. And they say about somebody doing charitable work, they do it and they don't get the hit and the kick and they give up. But the people who are totally committed to the work violence of the charity, they'll overcome the odds, they'll keep at it, and then the doors open. But the doors, sometimes they open immediately, but sometimes they don't. You know, do you, do you know, what is that pattern, Queen? You know, they say no good deed goes unpunished. Yes. Sometimes when you do something immediately, there's a bang. But if you hold your nerve, the doors do always open then, don't they? What mm. is that? Sometimes they open immediately, sometimes not. What is that, Queen? I'm not sure. Commitment, I suppose. Um, you know, because sometimes, like, well, I can speak for myself, sometimes I get this idea that I want to do something, right? And maybe it is charity because I've got this idea for my, for my non-profit, right? And, and um, you think about it and think about it and think about it, and you have to take that step because the doors don't seem to open. They don't seem to open. And then, and then it's like, it's almost like saying, okay, are you really going to commit to this? Are you, does this really feel like you want to do this? Are you really going to do this? Or are you going to accept that the doors aren't opening? Are you going to accept all these obstacles? Or are you going to push through them so that the doors can open, right? Because maybe it's like, uh, I want to do this, but are you really committed to it? Or are you just dabbling and playing or like breadcrumbing or whatever it is, but you're really doing something else or whatever it is. So what are you doing? Maybe that's what it is. Kamala Harris, sorry, I was just, I should, I should have been listening. I was thinking, just thinking, Kamala Harris used two famous F-bombs. Do you know them, do you? <laughs> I, I understand and respect that the whole, everyone has different um, opinions about abortion and women, and, and I told you, and they, they have their things that make that happen. That's, the discussion is very important, and tolerating each other's rather different points of view That's is very important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but she did say when she heard that Roe v. Wade was overturned, she said, I got to get the fuck out of Washington. So, so. And the other famous time she said about the, the, the barriers that women meet, uh, generally speaking, she said, uh, sometimes when you meet a door, you have to put the F, she said. Um, Einstein said, the, what do you say, that the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a yes. change. But yes. sometimes if you bang, 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 bang against that door, the same banging, eventually that door does come down. Yes. Yeah. It's like yes. sometimes the universe says, how much do you want this? Are you sure? And you're thinking, am I sure? Is it worth I've been waiting for the muse a long time. How much am I? I'll wait forever for this muse because I got to write this. And so then the muse is there right away. How much do you want it? I think we're yes. testing the right. And sometimes yes. you say, maybe I don't yes. want 
I, I yes. once asked for it. I once asked for um I, I thought, hey God, I know you can do anything right. And God said, I know you could heal my short sightedness, couldn't you? He said, How much do you want your perfect vision, Thomas? I don't know. Well, come back to me. <laughs> You know, if, if I really, insane. really, 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 really totally believe that my eyes would be perfect in the morning, I guess they would, but I don't want that. I, and I, I wouldn't be ready. I'm just not ready for that kind of move. I'm just not. I would like walking on water, same thing. I just, or, or levitating, or pushing, or bending spoons, that kind of stuff. I'm just not ready for that. If ever one day I am, then I'll probably take the branches anyway. I want to be, oh, see what I did, you know. Yes, 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 that's but, exactly. But, well, you know, if, if someone, honestly, if someone said, would you like to be able to walk on water? Would you like to be able to raise corpses from the dead? Or would you rather have interesting conversations and, and, and joke with people and it's one or the other? Oh, well, if it's one or the other, you can leave the corpse, I think corpses are there and you can leave the water. It's cold and wet and damp anyway, I guess I don't, you know. Yes. We don't appreciate the incredible gifts we have to it. That's exactly, that's exactly what it is. Because we keep ourselves caged in this, in this caged all the time. And um, you, as, as you're going along and you're trying to see, you were talking about uh, breaking down a door. Uh, sometimes we try and break that door down and, and in the, while we're trying to break that door down, other doors are opening there, here, and it's like, hello, we're here, hello, we're here, hello, we're here, hello, you're here. And you're going like, I have to go down this path because I'm saying that I have to go down this path. Like, what are we doing? <laughs> well, uh, John Cleese and, and Robin Skinner, one of his therapists, wrote two wonderful books called uh, One of His Families and I to Survive Them. Another was Life <laughs> survivor you know. did you read them <laughs> no. in, 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 it's wonderful comment. in one of them he talks about tunnel vision which guys are pretty great at you know and this is a terrible joke i shouldn't tell but you can edit it if you like this guy's on a desert island for a long time with a dog and a pig and um he's a young man and he's got his natural instincts and the pig begins to see more and more and more and more and more attractive to it but every time he tries to become intimate with the pig the dog gets him in the act and finally, one day, this beautiful girl that swims ashore comes up and says, is there anything I can possibly do for you? And he says, yeah, could you hold that dog aside? You're going to delete that. <laughs> but I mean, they give that as an example of tunnel vision. But we all do that. We're the hell bent on the the, 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 the holy, the, what is it, the grail? Yes, and the grail. yes. And, 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 and the quest is actually the grail, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> oh my God, the quest is the grail, you know. Oh, it really is. It's the journey. But but if it weren't for the Grail, we wouldn't take that particular journey. We're, we're meant to, the pot of gold or the rainbow or the pearl or whatever, we're meant, we're meant to be drawn to that. Otherwise, we wouldn't have that journey. But eventually we realize, oh my God, every step along the journey could be as glorious as reaching the destination and more glorious if we set out. If we could, if, if, no, it couldn't be that good, could it? <laughs> And that, that is the power of now, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Because also, you know, like going back to, I, I know I'm, I'm just happy with this, but I, I was, as you were talking about, I just had this vision of, I, I insist, there's something that I want in my life, okay? And I'm still insisting on that. Um, but then it's like, sometimes we get to that point and we think, why are we accept? Why did we want this so much? Because this is really breadcrumbs anyway. <laughs> it's not the, the the whole the whole thing could have been that or could have been that, and we didn't see it again. The same kind of story all the time. I still do yeah. But I suppose that's what makes the human experience so exciting. And 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 realizing that you're becoming slightly less unenlightened is a huge thrill too. Yeah. <laughs> There really is. There's hope for me. There is. There really is hope for me. Oh my God! There's hope for me. <laughs> and that, that's that's. And then before you turn on the thing we were talking about, that I said that. I speak to a Jesuit now regularly. A very learned priest. He's 84, 85. Father Barney McGuffin. Wonderful, loving man. We had the most wonderful conversations. He said that. Um, I told him I approached another Jesuit once, and an old guy. Paul Stevenson, who's passed from us a long time ago, and asked him um, about predestination, and he said, well, oh, that's one topic we Jesuits are warned never to preach a sermon on. Now, Father Barney bravely said, there can be tremendous consolation in understanding the concept of predestination properly, and he's right. But um, I think there's tremendous, infinite consolation and infinite good news 
in the story of Jesus if we saw him as one of us and if we saw that all the miracles he did, we can do two and more because we see that he, <laughs> he had these off moments and off days too. When we, that, when we see that, and it's there in the Gospels as handy down to some of the stories where he, where he gets despairing and frustrated and miserable and angry and impatient and abandoned and hopeless. When we see that, um, it's the most tremendous consolation. You think, God, yes. he was so stupid too, you know? So, yes. And because, yes. because of, you know, the, the joke that when you beat yourself up for an, an outbreak of ego, that's just more ego, you know? When you get angry with yourself for losing your temper, that's more temper. <laughs> but but, but when, we, when we think there's no hope made, then but when we realize that we're meant to fall again and again and again every time we fall and get up, Responded. Wow, the falls were necessary. The getting up made me really strong. Wow, and eventually, eventually, maybe I won't even need to fall anymore at all. Yes, 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 yes. yes. That's exactly when when you you you're walking along and you see that hole this time for the first time, and you can step over it or around it because oh. you you don't react anymore because it's like. Yes. It doesn't matter anymore. And I think we were speaking about that earlier, um, about something that you want it, you want it, you want it. In manifestation, let's go back to the manifestation, where you want it, you want it, you want it, you want it. And the more you want it, the more the more you, you don't have it, and the more it moves away from you. And then when you get to the point where it's like, I don't care. I, I don't care. Whether, if I want it, it's good. If I don't get it, it's also good then somehow it moves closer towards us, right? There's an apathetic acceptance and there's a very positive acceptance of all that is. And it's, it's very paradoxical and subtle and it's important. And I think it's fascinating that when Jesus was asked how to pray, apparently, or many times, five, six different occasions, you could say that everything he ever said was about how to pray, how to manifest. But he said one, once he said, uh, I like totally taken again, he, but he didn't say when you probably, it's, how was it translated and retranslated and whatever, but that he said, when you want something, he said, it's translated, believe you have already received it. Yes. So they says it's yes. probably more feel that you've already received and it will be yours. But that when you have that that feeling of gratification and gratitude and joy of having had it, then you realize, no, I can, I can experience it even without the physical thing. Whether the physical thing comes now or not isn't so important. But on another occasion he said, he said, imagine the head of the house of the man. The man is asleep after midnight with his family. Someone comes banging on the door. He gets up, lets it in, and finds there's no bread. He, in turn, goes to the neighbor to borrow bread. The neighbor will get up after midnight, and if it's not out of grace and kindness and goodwill, just to get peace, he'll get up and give you the bread. And said, so it is with the Heavenly Father, the universe, the realm of. He said, if you want something bad enough, demand it. So, so that's like a contradiction, I mean, in a sense. But, but it's maybe when you meet that closed door and you say, I really need this, and I know I do because it's for a really, really good cause. I know, I've searched my heart, and I'm going to get it. Uh, come hell or high water, if not today, tomorrow, it's going to come. Then, then, you say, then it will come when it's meant to yes. come. Yes. It can yes. not come. Yes. Sometimes. Yes. So, and, and the other times he said about the other beautiful one, the most beautiful one of all, I think, which sums it all up, is that beautiful line, and it meant an awful lot to me even when I didn't understand it. Supposedly Jesus said, seek first the kingdom and all else will be given to you. And I thought, oh wow, purify your heart and ask for the highest. But then then when I was mentor, I heard Tole say that probably what he said was find first the kingdom. But if he, regardless, even if he said seek first the kingdom and then all else will be given to you, uh, it's kind of suggestion that if you seek it, you'll find it. And in the Gnostic Gospel, Thomas says, knock on the door will be open, asking you shall receive and start seeking you. So, so if he said, find first the kingdom, and if the kingdom is your higher consciousness, that you really don't mind about the physical stuff manifesting or not. If you go there first and realize that you can already, you can enjoy at some level the most wonderful music, rock music or symphonies, whatever you want in your head just by Imagining them, mm, mm, mm. You, you, you don't really need the symphonies. You can, you can, you can hear them. Yes, yes. And, yes. and you can savor whatever you want. And when you realize 
that in that highest state of consciousness, and we can always get higher and deeper, that that when we're attached to divine, as she said, when we're at our higher levels of consciousness or raise our vibration, that um, that Jesus was so right when he said, See, find first, find first the kingdom, and all else, everything else is there anyway. So, so I guess that solves the paradox of, of do I abandon it or accept it or whatever, that when you get to that higher place, that everything is going to happen exactly when and as it's going to happen. Yes. yes. And, and paradoxically, yes. I think in the quantum physics, when you get there to, you, um, when you collapse the superposition or whatever, you, you, in my father's, you have reached the father's house then, and then you can access any of these glorious mountains rather than descending back into hell again. And the hell is not being in that state of seeking your highest consciousness. The hell is being lost in the physical world where, you, where at some level you often have not make things better for anybody. That's hell. Yes, that's exactly. Yes, yes. Um, but And, and then it's again, it's, it's, it's just to, to, to swap it like you have, it's like an, a feeling of, of, of expansion, abundance where you, you know that you've got it within you. And, and when you're seeking it, when you're seeking it and you don't accept that you can have it, then it's this lack and it, it goes away because you're not in your true state, right? In your true state connected to the divine, connected to God or whoever, the universe. Um, yes. Because you, 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 you're looking at your life from a smaller perspective of yourself. Yes. So... Yes, they would and make that, sense. And that famous one, which uh, that you read, uh, he supposedly said, "I came that you may have life and have it more abundantly." Yes. Yeah. But but we taught so from a, a, a young age. We taught about lack. There's not enough money. There's not enough. There's not enough food. There's not enough of this. There's not enough of that. You must stop laughing. You must stop. You must do work hard so that you can get whatever you have to get and get your house and your go to university and all these things and and that's all lies really if you think about the you know from a yes. philosophical point of view. That, that the whole the most basic lesson that the world teaches us the most false and basic one is things are not as they should be yes and, yes and the, re the reason we need to change them is because they're not as they should be and you go along to a wonderful scientific doctor and often the doctor is that your blood pressure is not what it should be your cholesterol is not what it should be your triglycerides we shouldn't kind of be starting from here at all your weight's on it but you know if you do everything right maybe Maybe we'll get them to somewhere within a reasonable, you know, if you follow all my instructions and you lose the weight and all. But, um, but we're probably not starting from where we should be starting from. And, and the science itself, which I see in Western science, and probably the Judeo Christian tradition, is well, there's, there's nature and there's man, and man's, man's out of kilter with nature, and things aren't as they should be. And Tony puts it in one of his tastes, and he says, um, we have a moral superiority to reality. You know? We think reality, things shouldn't be like this. We feel yes. morally superior to reality. I mean, that's how ridiculous it is. Instead of saying, nicely, it is what it is. Yeah, sure, it is. It is what it is. There's no art. And let's start from here. And, yes. and let's stop saying, it shouldn't be here. Just, just it is what it, we're starting from here. And then eventually you realize we're starting from the perfect place. Oh my goodness. We're always yes. exactly in the right part of the journey, and yet we think it should, be, and it can be better. But and some metaphysicians, teachers say, of course, um, there's nothing wrong, but everything must change. So that's good. And um, I think that everything is right, but it can always be a writer kind of thing. Yes. Right. But 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 the, but the Western, the traditional Western economic theory is, we shouldn't be starting from here. Things aren't as they should be. That's why we need to change them. Instead of things are absolutely incredibly beyond perfect already, which means we can change and make them even better. You know, that's that's an entirely different attitude. Isn't it? Yes, yes. And, and often when when people talk about surrender and acceptance, they say that's apathy. You know, you shouldn't. Things aren't. You shouldn't accept. But but the most powerful place to change from is let's do this from exactly where we're starting from, because we're starting from the too perfect place. That this world isn't perfect. It's so infinitely beyond perfect. But 
because we can make it more perfect. We don't create one utopia and stay there. We can always, always, always make it better, better, better. Yes, how, yes. How yes, and that's exciting. But that's also another thing when you, you're growing up. It's like, what will happen when I reach the utopia? Then I'm going to die, you know, like... Uh, you know, but you don't realize that once you reach, then you can see the next level and the next level and the next level and the next level. But sometimes you can only see that one little level when, you, when you're when small here and you can only see that one little level. There's much more than that, but we're not taught that. So, you know, you sometimes you, I mean, I, I remember going through, you go through life thinking, what happens if I'm too good? You know, what happens if I exceed my, my, my expectations? What will, I, what will happen? How will I be judged? How will I die after that? What will I do? So it's better to stay the way you are because this is what you're taught. The subconscious minds are conditioned so powerful, aren't they? Yes. Yes. And then you realize one day it's like, whoa, there are endless possibilities because this is who I am, you know, this is the world. This is, let's just enjoy it. <laughs> yeah, Kelly, my wife had one nice kind of analogy once that you have a, you might have a plain um, placemat for your plate, food, dinner table. It might be black or it might be very artistic. And then you might realize, oh my goodness, it's got to have squares on it. You can play drafts. Or you can play chess on it. You know, yeah. Actually, there's a little button here, and you can pull out these chess men. And then there's a, oh my goodness, there's another button that turns into the flying saucer that you can step into, and visit other galaxies and other dimensions. And and all these. And to some people, well, actually, it is just a placemat, and it can serve as that. Okay? And and life is a bit like that. That and our thoughts and our thing that we walk around this physical world of limitation. You earn a million a year, a uh, hundred dollars a year. And you spend 101 year in debt, you spend 99. And that those laws are true, absolutely true. But it doesn't mean that, that underneath them aren't more and more and more incredibly fabulous laws also, which, yes, yes. which most of us don't acknowledge, but they're absolutely true as well. And one of them is that we think are in reality, that, um, which is the essence of all the, I suppose, spiritual teaching always. And Lao Tzu said, at the center of your being, you have the answer, you know who you are, and you know what you want. And, um, and the essence of all spiritual teachings is you can create your own reality. And the physical actually is incidental, but it follows the spiritual. Yes, the, the, yes. The, or there, someone said simply anything the mind can conceive and believe it can achieve. But in, in that sense, that, um, that and, and that when we accept to, I guess, that our conditioning, when we think it's wrong and, and holds us back and stuff, if we think, if we think, well, hang on. If, the, if there is one source, then the source of the unlimited possibilities and dreams is the same source that produced our stupid dysfunctional conditioning, their ego, and our nastiness. Maybe there's more to that ego and nastiness and stupidity and dysfunction and conditioning than I thought. And if it weren't for all that, maybe I should be thankful for my conditioning. Yes. And, and work with it and not just revile it and, 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 and denigrate it. And, and I guess in that moment, then, then we can transcend it more powerfully. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. And then, you get, and then you get the healing and then suddenly you see things from a different perspective and you see those doors again. And they start to open or not, you know, um, because it's, Things don't matter, like little things don't matter anymore. You know, something that up upset me maybe even a year ago, that doesn't matter anymore. Even last week, you know, you just see it for what it is because that stuff doesn't matter. Yeah. In the end, um, the only thing that matters is you, the way you behave in your life and your life. And everything else has got nothing to do with you and is none of your business. Hang on. Right? If, that, if, that, if that last were quoted out of context, you're you're an incredibly powerful therapist, Jeff Rina, and I have to say that that I've had a number of chats with you, and each time I do come away, orders of magnitude healed by talking with you. You have a tremendous gift. Of, of, in fact, I couldn't underestimate. I couldn't pay you enough for that. 
it's um, what you've done for me is absolutely amazing. You 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 reminded me of all the things I've forgotten and you've brought them. Thank you. And um, there's so That's so so if, if someone were to quote what you said there, it's only about you and that idea that yeah, it's leaving out the fact that you're not denying that that what you are is. When you have the ability to leave green and completely out of it, there's an it's an unlimited healing that can flow through you. Green, right? so, so, so I guess what you're saying when, when you when you totally step aside and realize it's not about you, then you become infinite. Yes, yes, yeah. yes, and it's not about the other person either, because a lot of times you mirror each other anyway. So. So if the other person is behaving badly, for the want of a better word, I mean, that again is, is, is very judgmental and very relative, right? Because badly is relative. Um, instead of looking at them and saying, like, why are you behaving badly? Look at yourself and going, like, what am I doing here? What is, who am I in relation to this? Why is he behaving badly or she's behaving badly? Why is this happening in my in my, uh, world right now? And how does it affect me? What is? What do I need to learn from this situation for myself? Uh, and then next time that happens, you realize, well, whatever it was, I've seen it, and now it doesn't matter because I don't have to react to the way they're behaving because at the end of the day, it's them, not me. I sound like I'm talking in, in riddles, but you understand. No, no, no. no. Um, Tole, again, I'll come back to that, but Tole, he, he talks about um, becoming transparent to the insults, you know, becoming so, and that, that's beautiful, then you become invulnerable on F-U-C-K-A-B-L-E with, you know, that, that, um, that, that when you, you can actually imagine yourself totally transparent and just let the insults and stuff slide right through. And, and interesting, when you, I think that's what Paramahansa Yogananda probably, I can't do that, of course, but I know it's possible. That, that that when you offer no resistance, then the people, if you're speaking to someone, they're telling you all kinds of BS, whether it's politics, religion, and it's very aggressive, that, that when you don't react at all, you notice them immediately, generally speaking, they immediately begin to mellow. Yes. And, and if you yes. wait long enough, then they start telling you your own BS, and you think, what? <laughs> 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 but, and, and you know, I, I mentioned before I, the famous story I like to believe about Paramahansa Yogananda. I don't know if it's true or not, but someone pulled a gun on him, and that, that um, Yogananda had time to look at him with such love and humor and joy that the guy collapsed, dropped the gun, burst into tears, and became a devil too. I, 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 I believe that's absolutely possible. And I know I'm not capable of that yet, maybe one day. But 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 that was not just becoming transparent to the to the aggression. But, but just flooding it with peace and joy and light and love. For that. Yeah, and that one, that any human being can do that is very encouraging. And then there's a much more concrete example if, if anyone wants to Google um, Len Dayton, D I G H T O N, an Australian, and Enough Road, to, uh, Enough Road, I think was his series. And he's an interview with Johnny Lee Terry, Johnny J H N N Y Lee Terry, C L A R Y. And, and he talks about what I mentioned here. And meeting the the um, Johnny Lee Terry was a clan, uh, a clan leader somewhere, and Reverend Wade Watts was a black minister who had a church, and um, and apparently Wade Watts pulled the kind of Yogananda on Johnny Lee Terry, and he became a great friend of his, just by refusing to be intimidated. Not only refusing to be intimidated, but not bending him like Reed, but meeting him with joy and with love. And, what yes. a story. It's on YouTube. That, that is beautiful. That is a beautiful story. It, it's me. And, and that web, the name Wade Watts is, is pretty well unknown. In fact, you know, Johnny Lee Terry. Just, but when, you, when I think that if one of us human beings is capable of doing that, then presumably we all are. Yes. And that's our future. That's our future. Yes. Yes. It's, that's that beautiful. And, and but also if you if you can step away for a moment and realize that a lot of people do things out of fear and desperation, right? Um, and if we can turn that around and, and, and love them instead, um, then everything changes. Uh, it's funny how um, this, uh, when I was in South Africa, we went, we, we moved into a house 
and um, that night, you know, Luca, now, Luca was smaller then, he was younger then, you know, he was like 10. Um, that night when we were when we were sleeping at about 3 a.m., I heard something at the door, and as I went to the door, um, three black men came into the house. I mean, it doesn't matter, three men came into the house with guns, and they said, you know what, we're going to kill you, we want everything, you know? It was, it was a home invasion. And it's, it's interesting how um, I knew that we were safe. Even when Luca, then Luca woke up and he screamed, Ma, you know, and they threatened me and they threatened him. You know, like, if he doesn't keep quiet, we're going to kill him. But at that moment, even though it, we were in that situation and I was terrified, I knew I was safe because somehow the situation changed because they took everything and they, they made me load my car. But that wasn't the point because at the end when they left, we were safe, the first thing. And the second thing is that they they said to the, the one guy said to me, "Don't worry, we will we'll leave your car, so you'll still get your car back." And Lu, and and even with Luca, they said, "You know what? Don't worry, we won't hurt you." So even in a situation like that, somehow it was still all turned out. I mean, it was horrible and it was traumatic. There's no doubt about it, but it still worked out perfectly, and we weren't harmed. So there is there is some it's something to say to say about love or, 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 or about knowing that you're safe in any situation. So yeah, I don't know if it's not the same kind of thing, but it's it's similar kind of you know feeling that if you know you're safe and you don't panic and you and and you you just like I was just saying praying all the time you know that I'm safe I'm safe I'm safe. And somehow you are. And whether you're praying or if, if it's energy or whatever it is or whatever you believe, it still works, right? You never know how it's going to, of course, that's part of it. No, you that's don't. It. You don't. But I think the big thing here is not to give in to fear because fear is, is like... You know, like a, a dog will, will attack you if you're afraid of the dog. Um, it's the same kind of thing. It, so you it, have to. It, it may attack you if, if you stare them down. If you become assertive enough, and even though you are fearful, if you become, try it, buddy, and, <laughs> and harness your fear. And, and yeah, yeah, I've seen little kittens stare down at dogs sometimes. Yes, yes. Some of the world with old look at that dog, and the huge dog backs off from the little kitten. You see that too, and, and I've seen bulls back away from a small dog. It's it's the attitude of bring it on. And, yes, and yes, yes. Yeah. You're not going to accept. You're not going to accept it. Yeah. So, so it's it's that. Your, your fear is there, but you kind of harness it. You, you, say, yeah, yeah. you don't let it you know, overwhelm you. And our, no. our it, whether it's us or something else bigger than us, is, is guiding us then. Yeah. 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 We, we, don't, we never know how we're going to react in any particular circumstance. No, right? no, no. no. No, but I, I suppose I mean, whoever who was it said that only love is real, right? And you've got to believe that all the time, because otherwise, what are you going to do? You know, you can't you can't give in to fear, because then you you can, of course, you can do whatever you want to, but if I had given in to fear and I had begged and pleaded on that day, I don't know what would have happened, but I don't think I'd be having this conversation with you right, right now. And, and of course, your, your panic can make the guys more nervous. Yeah, yeah. Uh, shoot the bitch quick before she does something stupid. You know. Yeah. Like, yes. um, there, there's a great, case, beautiful case of um, I love Steve Irwin, rest his soul, um, the Australian crocodile hunter guy. Yes, uh, yes, yes. And and my favorite one, I haven't seen many of his, but my favorite one, my favorite one is where he thinks he sees a rattlesnake and he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, love that's my real favorite bit that he, that he, he broadcast that anyway. But um, but the other one is where he's uh, resting with the, the ten foot tiger shark. He says it's the most dangerous thing he's ever done. He's done with the snorkel and the knife, trying to free him from the shark net. And he voices over afterwards and he says, I love this guy, but he thinks I'm his enemy. And uh, Steve, so his whole MO is there that he's, when he says, I love this guy, he's telling himself, I love this guy. He's trying to calm Steve down because Steve. He knows that if he panics, if he doesn't stay calm, the shark is going to feed his energy. He's yes. like a yes. And the shark is yes. much more likely to turn around and bite, bite his arm off. 
And so he, <laughs> you've got to stay calm. It's, it's a huge challenge. If, if the guy walking across on the tightrope across Niagara Falls stays calm and thinks just like six inches, um, he'll probably do it. If he gets worried, he probably won't. Um, it, it's hard to stay calm under pressure, but I, I guess practicing when we're not under such pressure is, is a good. That beautiful poem, both passively, Desiderata, says that nurture, strength, of spirit to, to shield you in adversity. I guess take the time to, when the pressure isn't there, to try and be your fullest and most powerful self. As well. yes. When you mentioned, Karina, just the rush of thoughts, when you mentioned earlier you come through the hole and you decide to walk around it. The other one I love from Harrison Ford's movie, um, Indiana Jones, one of them, I think it's the Temple of Doom or something, in one of them, the cave looking for the crystal skulls, or something, I'm not sure, and there's an abyss, and for some reason he steps out of the abyss and a flagstone immediately comes under his foot. And then he hesitates a moment, and he takes another step, another flagstone comes out. Yes. And each time, yes. he's walking the walk of faith, of course, and each time it's a challenge, just because it's happened once, doesn't mean it's going to happen again, and just because it's happened twice doesn't mean that he, but he does it. And each time it's, but each time it's a slightly lesser challenge. And and I think life is often like that. I asked a lady in the feed store once, "What is the meaning of life?" And she said, "The usual." She said, "Huh?" And I said, <laughs> the of "Life," which was the answer, right answer, of course. And like a neighbor, I said, "What does it mean?" Life? I said, "How do you mean?" She said, "Very smart lady." I said. I said, well, obviously we're here to learn lessons and 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 lessons. And lessons. But do we ever get to use the lessons for <laughs> God or anything, you know? And she laughed then. And I knew, when she laughed, I knew it would be good. She said, one thing's sure anyway. I said, what's that? She said, the lessons get harder until you get them. <laughs> yes, and yes. Said, that's exactly. But then they get easier. And I said, Harrison Ford, the first step in the abyss, the flag, maybe it'll happen again. And eventually you become so confident in the that the lessons you have all the lessons i suppose you conquer fear and then who knows karina but yes. uh, but, yes. but but there is the, there is the possibility i think of someone like leonard cohen an old guy rocking it to the very end he said he tried all kinds of drugs and religion but cheerfulness kept breaking through he <laughs> found kind of peace and joy and enlightenment towards the end of his long life and and i think all of us can at any stage just find that clear blue water Yes. The challenges, their challenges, but we know we've been through worse. The lessons get harder and then they get easier. Yes. Yes, that's right. That's right. And sometimes they just don't matter anymore. God, I've seen that one before. Yes, yes. I'm not walking down that road anymore. I'm taking this path. I'll walk down without sandals barefoot. That story I love. <laughs> yes. Who needs the sandals? Well. I can go barefoot. Pretend I came to the beach. Pretend nothing. Just who needs sandals? <laughs> yes. Who needs sandals? And the funny part is that no one even noticed anyway. Because no one does. Everyone's so self involved, you know, and they're so, like, you're so worried about what people think and being judged. And at the end of the day, no one, no one really cares, you know. That is the hugest liberate. That is the one great thing about getting older to realize, find, become less and less self-conscious. Until yes. a lot of people said that eventually they, don't, they dress in weird clothes, they don't care about <laughs> me, just don't care anymore. They, they kind of realize, who cares? That's that's a that's the greatest consolation of all of growing old. You lose nearly all inhibitions. Uh, Leonard Cohen said that he was reliably informed that. He, that the, the cells in your brain that are responsible for anxiety tend to die out with age. <laughs> I'm surprised if some idiot neuroscientist said that. But regardless, you do lose your inhibitions eventually. Who cares? Yes. Who cares? Yes. And that is freedom. Absolutely. Right? That, is, <laughs> that is freedom. That's getting out of our conditioned mind. The conditioned mind says everybody cares. Your mother yes. says, that's not properly. Wipe your face. What do the neighbors think? <laughs> That's always the thing, like, what will the neighbors think? And that, that, that was the biggest thing, that with those shoes, I had to try and fix them to make them, because, I mean, I couldn't go without. And then the shoes were saying, like, oh, God was saying, ha, 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 no, you know? You know, God, man plans and God laughs. What are you going to do? Then you hesitated to share the story. <laughs> I did, I did. No, but the lessons were getting easier. One sandal, two sandals. Story, I'll tell the story. <laughs> yes, I'll tell the story. I mean, like, what are you going to do? Yeah, I, ha I might have people like unsubscribing to my newsletter, but hey, so what? You know, it doesn't matter. 
it really doesn't matter anymore, does it? Wonderful. Yeah. And I think again that's freedom, where it's like, yeah. Uh, yeah, it really doesn't matter, you know. If you like me, I'm like this. If you don't like me, I'm still like this. So you either, I saw uh, you either uh, you either part of my past or you want to be a part of my future. But this is who I am. Mm -hmm. So that's the way it is. Mm -hmm. you yes. Wonderful. I love any guru who, who talks, who tells a joke against themselves. Then, then I can trust them, maybe. And how often do you meet a religious leader or a politician making fun of themselves? Not terribly often yet. No, no, no. And that's power as well, because then you know that, I mean, who you, who's, who, you're not going to laugh at others. That's not fair. But you can laugh at yourself. And that's the fun part, too. There was a way back, there was a little ray of hope way back in the Clinton era when um, Yeltsin, remember the drunken, <laughs> and he had some big talks at Camp David, and they came out afterwards, you know, and they, Yeltsin said, um, I don't know, Clinton was saying talks were constructive and whatever the usual cliches are, you know, and um, he said, and uh, then they said, did you hear what Yeltsin said about him? And Clinton said, no. <laughs> and they told him Clinton was first time. It was so wonderful. <laughs> and in Ireland, the Prime Minister in Ireland was waiting at Shannon Airport for Yeltsin to drop in and give him his blessing, kind of dignifying our little Prime Minister, Charles Hoy, with these military, Irish military. <laughs> and uh, the plane stopped and Yeltsin was indisposed, apparently. <laughs> so he never came out of the plane at all, and all the Irish welcoming was left to try and remain dignified. <laughs> It was a great year. It was like God said, here's Yeltsin God. And here's Monica Lewinsky. And, oh, and, yes. And, and do, you, do you think that God really takes his kind of so seriously when he throws you this kind of stuff? Not mentioning any present politicians, you know. That said, if I were in Gaza, I would be taking the politics very, very, very seriously. I know I know, mm -hmm. I know I need to exist. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and I know, I do also firmly believe that when we can save a little bit of our sense of humor, we're much, much, in a much stronger position to to, um, to help all the agonies going on in the world and stop all yeah. the problems of hunger and war and conflict. We, we, getting dragged into the drama wholesale is not going to help us. We yes. can sympathize and empathize and throw them lifelines but, um, and take their suffering to heart. But if we think it's a terribly, if we think for a moment that it's not the best of all possible worlds, then why try our best to make it better? If it is the best of all possible worlds, we can endlessly make it better. Now that it is. All it's just the country must withstand it. It lives on hope and love, doesn't it? Exactly. And it can always be better. What, what could possibly be better than the fact that it can always be better and we can always help to make it better? Yes. The more one could be more. Yes. Yes. And sometimes just by catching someone's eye in the street, a homeless person, looking at them as though they, they know what we're thinking. We're thinking, I could be you, buddy. And thanks for doing this for me. Yes. So often people who I know who've experienced homelessness and, and who understand it say, whatever money or food or anything, just, just interact with them. Just look them in the eye and let them know that, you, that they're your equal and, and that their story matters and what they're doing matters. It's, their sacrifice is not wasted. Let them know, and then when they know that, maybe they've got the lesson and they can move on. Yes, yes, yes. I love that. That's so true. That's so true. Now, if we don't realize that uh, what, a, what a difference that makes to anybody, um, to everybody we meet, and, and, and to us as well, um, on some level, because of course it's, um, it's a conversation and it's a two-way street. Mm -hmm. Like everything, every interaction changes us, right? Mm -hmm. For the better. Yes, yes. The, the great apostle Paul said, "All things work for the glory of God for those who love Him." I think, but leave out the last bit. All, all things work. It's all. It's all. If, 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 if there were any mistakes, it would mean God wasn't in charge and the devil put influence. It's, if, if we trust that everything is in divine right order, we trust that we're always starting where we're meant to be starting. If we trust that we're always the right place on our quest for the Holy Grail, then, then then we're in the most powerful place to, to take action, if action is called, isn't it? Yes, yes. It shouldn't be like this. 
Yes. I meet an odd white feather and whenever I do, I meet a lot of them. Whenever I do, it's like oh, you were meant to find that feather. So you're meant to be here now. You're meant to be, well, you're always meant to be exactly where you are. Here's another reminder for you. You're always exactly where you're meant to be. Yeah. I, say to I say to Christians sometimes about heaven on earth, I say, if you honestly for one moment could believe that you're exactly where you are, with exactly the right body, male or female, doing exactly what you're meant to be doing for God, thinking exactly the thoughts you're meant to be doing, acting exactly as God wants you to, wouldn't you already be in heaven? <laughs> yes, exactly. Wouldn't exactly. you? Exactly, yes. Yes. Right here on earth, the Catholic Catechism has said heaven is a place or a state. Of, oh my goodness, if it, it is a place or a state, state of consciousness. State of consciousness. State yes. of hope, state of love, state of faith, state of the state of upset, state of maybe this is what God wants me to be doing right now. Yes. And, and a state of thinking, choice. Yeah. And choice. When I was, yes, cho well, well, when I was being an idiot and totally lost a while ago, maybe that's what God needed then too. Forgive, forgive. You were talking about meeting these um, people who are very aggressive and nasty and belligerent and in your face and stuff. But 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 when we meet them and don't react to them, that that is I, that's only because we see. Oh yeah, uh, I've been there. Yes. And yes. that we've come we've come to complete terms with that idiot in ourselves and we, and and forgiven it so completely that when we see it in someone else, we say, Oh yeah, that, I get that. Whereas when you haven't acknowledged it and met it and made friends with it yourself, with your own that demon and you see it in someone else, you go, well, that's, that's not okay. Yes, yes. So, so that's, it's at that point when, when that's why triggers are your best, um, are your best lessons, right? And your yes, best yes, healing yes. points. Yes. Because then you can see, wow, you know what, I was that person and Yes. Why am, I, why am I reacting? Because I haven't yeah. forgiven myself for that, be, for being that person at some yeah. point. Yeah, Gandhi said that the, all the demons are running around in our own hearts, and that's where we must meet them or confront them every day. Right? And um, James Joyce, way back 100 years ago, good old James Joyce said something like, wherever you go, whoever you meet, brothers and all robbers, thieves, hoodlums, wherever you meet, you're always meeting yourself, Joyce said, which is, um, oh my goodness. And, and yes. if you like to say, what if God is one of us, if, if they're all Jesus? If Jesus said, what do you say? As long as you do it for one of these, at least for my brethren, you do it for me. Yes. What, what if, if, if it, not just metaphorically, if physically, always is yourself in another form? And um, and, and Carl Jung, of course, put a view, I think he said that those who annoy us, those who irritate us most, have something to teach us about ourselves. That, yes. I mean, the basic psychology, isn't it? Projection. Yes. And then the beam in your brother's eye, all that stuff. But 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 the, the the hope is that when we've finally seen all our enough our con subconscious mind and our conditioning and our stupidity and our demons to 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 recognize and acknowledge them, befriend them, and so on, that 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 is that we can get to the end of them. Then then that's that would if you ever reach there, that's enlightenment, isn't it? Yes. Yes. Yes, I'd say. But I mean, we it, it never we never really get there because then something else comes up and, and we just go further and further and further up. And and as I was, uh, you know, as you were speaking, I, I also thought about uh, wherever you go, you take yourself with you. I don't know who said that. Someone, someone said it. Um, I, 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 I'm going to say anonymous because I don't remember. And and you'll see how some people they 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 go into um, a situation and they have the situation like people start reacting in a certain way or people start behaving in a certain way so they leave the situation and then they go into another situation and the same thing happens like you have you attract the same people with just different faces and different names but it's the same people doing the same things um, like relationships as well you know if you don't if you don't heal yourself you keep attracting the same kind of person into your life so it's like at one point you have to say okay stop i can't run anymore because I can run, but I can never hide from myself, right? Stop and, and see why is this happening? What is it that within me that I need to learn so that I don't need to treat the same people in my life? Because after a while, it gets exhausting. There, there are all kinds of explanations people say that you, you, you kind of create the circumstances, which sounds preposterous and 
crazy in new age. How can you create circumstances? We're not ruling the world. We're putting the molecules together. But, but actually, I think maybe you are. And life is a dream in that sense, a real dream. That um, that. There's so many ways of approaching that. One of them is that if we get into a rut and, and things are getting worse, and then we're making worse circumstances and worse and worse, the vortex and the spiral downwards, why should it ever stop? If we don't consciously, because often we don't consciously stop, but something something comes along and it stops, right? Thankfully. But eventually, we, we had, so it's like the lesson is coming that gets worse, and then, and then eventually we realize that we can press the stop button. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Well, yeah, constantly. And the the other the other thing is that I think when 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 this rottenness and the negativity comes on us, if we think that's ourselves, we're gonna think, oh, I'm a piece of this. Dish. Why do I do this? I'm so full of. But if we if we consider that it's maybe from outside of ourselves, and often our conversations return to this, if it's inherited dysfunction, inherited demons, inherited. Um, generational trauma, inherited ancestors, rubbish, inherited any, any way you put it, that, that that stuff, the bad moods and the hopelessness and the irritability and all that, if that's not really yours, if that's if that's been handed down from your ancestors for generations, and you think, whew, the box stops here, I'm powerful enough to, to transmute all that, it's been passed on generation after generation, has failed to recognize it for what it is, they've taught us their own inadequacy and stupidity and they've just got upset with themselves for getting upset, they've become angry for becoming angry, they've become in despair about being despair. And I now finally I can say Wow, what I've I can I can well, I can I have this this big black ball of stuff. I can I have the word with all to to transmit change that cool into diamond. If I think I have the word with all to do it, maybe I do. Because the same thing that passed to me gave me the mad notion that I could maybe be an alchemist and change it. Mm. Then, mm. then if we don't see it as our, as our own stuff and our own shortcomings that creates the negativity, it, it may become more easy to work on it. Mm. 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 Yeah, because I mean, you can see it outside there. Hmm. We've always, always come with this. You've always brought me around to that eventually, I think you're thinking, you're thinking <laughs> it's not my stuff, it's someone else's. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's uh, if you it's easier, like you said, it's e if you look at it from here, then it's easier to look at it and then you can accept it for what it is, I suppose. Um, but if you can heal it, then you can break those generational curses and and free your children. And free your, your ancestors, right? Because you've broken and, those curses. And the only work isn't really, it's just seeing it for what it is. Yes, You yes. don't have to get up and work, you just, you no. just see it, shine your light, and, and the light, of course, has been created by a whole lot of work, but once you have that light, you just, nice. Yes. You're given that, well, you've done a lot of work to get that light, but once you have the light and know you have it, then it's there and it can be effortless. Mm -hmm. Same when you see other people's demons likewise in traffic and everywhere else, you can effort to out there. They're having a bad day. <laughs> yes, yes. And it's okay, you know, it's their day and you don't have to get caught up in their, in their bad day. You just have to deal with the traffic and be and happy you, with it. And you can bless them and change their day as it is, you know you can, just by praying for the poor guy. Yes, and yes. And that might save them getting in some accident and killing somebody else. Yeah, yeah you can really just go forward. forward. Yes. Do that to each other. Yes. Really yes. Do. So instead of going like ah traffic, it's like okay, bless you, you know. Yeah. And, and it's just... crazy. I, sometimes when I get into these situations, traffic and guys give me a nice, terribly, terribly sorry kind of thing. They, it's okay, you know. <laughs> yes. And 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 you've changed their yes. anger in that. You just look. I'm so sorry. I'm an idiot, you know. Kind of. Sometimes <laughs> if you do that, then I think you're an idiot. But if if you really think I'm terribly sorry, yeah, I'm really sorry. I'm such a fool. Please forgive me. And the next time they meet an idiot like you, they'll, they, they, won't, they won't be hard at <laughs> me. You know, so those little interactions, all of them, have tremendous capacity to take the other one, haven't they? Yes, yes. Yeah. And, and often when I, I'm stupid and demented and foolish, I often realize, oh, well, it's, it's, 
it's an opportunity to make more mistakes and then to apologize and for making up can be like in that relationship, but making up can be incredibly powerful and healing, yeah. Yes. And, and it can spread out. Mm. And in Southern California, man, you you know in traffic, I don't know if you drive much, but in Southern California, people are incredibly forgiving. And, and to acknowledge how forgiving is, I'm on a, out on the bike often doing kind of crazy things, and they often, you know, and, and I, when I do, I try to be incredibly obsequious and unctuous and apologetic. And <laughs> when they met, meet a cyclist like that, I think they kind of, they might go easier on the next crazy cyclist. <laughs> Yes, uh, that's what I love because I'm. Uh, I mean, I walk everywhere, and wherever I am, if I'm in the street and I'm about to to cross, I always get you know the cars always stop for me and let me pa pass. It's like, wow, that is so incredible, you know. It's it's, it's so it's so such a loving thing to do. <laughs> so they are they are very forgiving, which is a great thing. Yep. Yep. And, and sometimes people look at you and they, they kind of know what you're about to. We, we, we have them, I mean, even from behind, people can, people know, if you're, if you're radiating goodwill, people sense it in the sun. Uh, we discussed that a little bit earlier this time that my, Kelly, my wife, said this morning that before I came home, the cat knew I was coming. And I said, do you really believe this? I said, yeah, I do. The top of the stairs, he out twice, ran down when you were 100 yards down the Wow. Well. And it's not that the cat and I, Tiger, are even particularly close. I wish we were, but um, but that's that psychic ability that cats have and dogs have. That's 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 a natural phenomenon that science hasn't explained yet. But it's I'm sure it's a wonderful experience. And I, I believe also that that when people look at us or hear us, that we emanate some kind of clues to our consciousness that that we pick up on each other energy. That, that science doesn't acknowledge that it's not light rays. I mean, we take in so much about other people. Just. Yes, yes. And, and how and how many times do we speak to people and um, you're saying one thing, but they're understanding something else because you're just not on the same page almost, or they're coming from a different perspective, or you're in a bad state or whatever. And that's interesting as well because you'll have the conversation, but it's... You, you say it, but it's not what you meant to say, but they pick up something else, so the conversation takes a whole different dynamic almost. Mm -hmm. It becomes a, a, a thing of its own, mm -hmm. which is interesting as well. Sometimes in both my marriages, I've sometimes realized, oh, we had a total misunderstanding there, wow. And then I think, I wonder how many misunderstandings we've had that <laughs> we never realized. <laughs> but. Um, but you realize the ones you meant to us was. I mean, yes. I mean the, the mistakes are, if anything is God given, our mistakes certainly are. I, I, I love in that beautiful poem, Dizzy Drata, he says, you know, go past it up and he says, um, beyond a wholesome discipline, beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. And whether or not it is clear to you, no doubt the universe is unfolding as it should. Yes. That's my sermon. I think, you know, if you think, if, if, whether it's one universe or many, it doesn't matter. If, if, if the one you're in is unfolding as it should, if you change any photon, you know, if you change a photon, that particular sperm cell wouldn't have created Adolf Hitler, you know. So every, down to the last photon, everything has to be in place for everything to happen. But yes. then you think, if the universe is unfolding as it should, then all the mistakes I made were necessary. In 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 whatever you know. Wow. And if my mistakes and accident, if I did, if I didn't bring those about deliberately, but they were meant to happen, then it was because something bigger or different from me that was working through me made those mistakes through me. Through my mistakes might be my best work. Oh my goodness! Oh, wow! Wow! <laughs> why do I so despise them? Why? Why am I so terrified of making them? Wow! Wow! That's true. Why are you so terrified of making them? I love that. Because, because I'm told that as a kid, of course, make a mistake, you're big enough. Now, be careful. Be careful. You need to be more careful. No, 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 no. Take care. Be careful. Don't make a mistake. And if you do, maybe think twice about telling me about it. <laughs> I'll, be, I'll be upset and I'll be disappointed. So maybe start 
perceiving and lying and trying the conspiracy against the truth that we grown-ups indulge in all the time. Wow. Uh, good old Ken Robinson in his TED Talks mentions about do schools kill creativity? He said, partly it's because we're taught to be afraid to make mistakes. Yes. That's so yes. Yes. Fear, fear, fear. Yes. That's why you have to start breaking them slowly, slowly, slowly. But we taught from a sm the, uh, the school system is is really. Pff, we won't exactly even what it's meant to be, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly what it's good no. from. A really good, a lot of work to do. Wow. Yes. Don't don't be a creative. Don't ask questions because if you ask questions, then you're going to be in trouble. And if you're in trouble, then you even you make mistakes. Then then it's the end of the world. And sit down and learn for free, and then go home and do more homework for free, and study all the study, because the meaning of life is, we don't even go there. <laughs> Just do it. Do not question. <laughs> yes. Just do it. I mean, the trafficking thing, I, I told you about attending the police station where the lady talked about trafficking, and she said she was explaining to her own three-and-a-half-year-old daughter what a dangerous world it is. And, and then she was saying that a whole lot of people being trafficked don't realize they are being trafficked. And then I, then I jokingly, I think, maybe I'm being trafficked and I don't know. And then I remember my first memory is no Santa Claus, but don't tell your younger brother and sister. But they'll behave all year for, for their present, you know, and so on, and so on. I mean, we're all trafficked, aren't we? And, and, and good old Bill Hicks, that one comedian again, he said, he said, one, he said you can tell a whole lot about a slide about the drugs it permits. In Western society, American society, what are the two drugs? First, well, Monday to Friday, caffeine to keep you a productive member of the workforce, the economy, and Friday to Monday, alcohol to make you so stupid you don't realize you're in a prison. Good old Bill Hicks, the gospel of Bill Hicks. Wow. <laughs> wow. Me, I drink caffeine on the weekends too, and, and you know, they, they said that the Irish, the reason God invented the alcohol was to save. Stop. Prevent the Irish from conquering the world. <laughs> conquering the alcohol level. Just by the way. But um, as I said earlier, but Bill Hicks was so right with me about all matter is merely energy condensed to slow vibration. We are one consciousness. We are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There is no death. Life is only a dream. And we are the imagination of ourselves. Here's Tom with the weather. Good old Bill Hicks. And when he said that, people kind of went... Right. Pass me the alcohol. <laughs> well, I mean, in it, we, are one sub, we are one consciousness experience, of, and the idiot I meet in traffic gives me one consciousness until I don't need to meet him again, and then I don't need him anymore. Yes, yes. Oh, and that's mate. the best part. The lessons get harder until we get them, and then they get easier, <laughs> and then they stop getting lessons on, and then we move on, God knows where and what. What, whatever, who knows? Yeah, and then we Thanks. meet new people because everyone comes into your life for a reason, a season, or a lifetime, right? So, or an, infinity, or an infinity of reasons, all the way. <laughs> maybe, maybe until I forget. I think I'm running out of caffeine and beginning to forget a bit. <laughs> wow, this has been a good conversation. I think we've been speaking for about two hours. Oh my goodness, no. <laughs> we always speak we always speak forever it's so cool um, well, but thank you we don't uh, we don't I, I record <laughs> I recorded the last bit we the most no because no, the inhibitions inhibit them.